Okay, it looks like most people have joined here. A few things before we get started. If you have any questions during the webinar, please place them in the Q&A section for us to, for the speakers to collect. Towards the end of the presentation, the speakers will be able to respond to them. Today's webinar is Compliance in the Age of Multilingual Communication. Our speakers today are Alejandro Diaz, Director of Sales at Sistram, Philip Steiger, Technical Account Manager at Sistram. We're very excited for to showcase and discuss with you the challenges the corporations are facing in regards to compliance in the global market and what tools are available today you can use to overcome these challenges. So to get us started, I'm gonna pass it over to Alejandro. Thank you for that, CJ. Hopefully everyone's doing well today and thank you for joining us today. In this webinar, we will go over three main topics. Discover the part language plays in monitoring activity, learn how you can quickly take data from diverse systems and translate it, and learn how to overcome the challenge of multilingual correspondence. But before we get to that, we're gonna do a quick audience poll that CG is gonna put up for you guys. And the question I pose to you guys is, have you or any of your team used free online translation tools? Give you guys a couple seconds to answer. All right, the results are in. It says 67% of you guys said yes, and 33% of you guys said no. Now with that, the reality is that some polls were given to executives and some of the things <clears throat> companies have discovered is that 35% of all SaaS applications used within the enterprise are non-approved contributing to shadow IT, as well as 80% of employees admitted to using non-approved SaaS applications to complete job tasks. We'll kind of go into that a little bit throughout our presentation. With that being said, let's get into the first topic. Discover the part language plays in monitoring activity. So you guys may ask yourselves, why monitor? Simply put, to reduce risk and protect brand value. Executives face constant pressure to identify and mitigate a growing list of regulatory and policy-driven risks. The volume, variety, and velocity of data created and used by organizations are exploding. The arrival of new communications media, such as email, chat, social media, and texting, creates new, often unmonitored means for sharing information and violating rules and procedures. Often more time is spent on tracking, analyzing, and implementing compliance. Common challenges that arise because of this are sensitive information being released, superseding established controls, parties sharing information, inappropriate information knowingly or unwittingly committing serious violations, an increase in violations of regulatory policies has resulted in more stringent scrutiny, larger fines, and widening regulation, as well as a huge effort required to comply in highly regulated industries. The need. This drives a need for localization and translation to be at the core of each global business. Financial services, banks, and insurances have never faced such complex regulations such as RCPA, FCPA, Basel, Solvency, in the Patriot Act, amongst others. Last year alone, the DOJ handed out $3.6 billion worth of fines. For global organizations across legal and language boundaries, facilitating corporate governance, risk, and compliance processes can be challenging due to cost and complexity. Ensuring compliance content is legal and understandable in all relevant languages is mandatory. If regulated content is not accurately translated, there can be serious consequences, including product recalls and prosecution. Regulation must be understood and adhered to by a multilingual workforce for activities in more than one country. Learning and training programs for operating complex machinery must be undertaken to ensure employee safety. This training must meet local regulations as well as local language requirements. All industries that produce large amounts of marketing, auditing, financial, scientific, and legal and technical content that is heavily regulated and destined for a global audience 
need to consider the language requirements throughout the entire content development process. With that, some challenges that occur. One challenge that has become a major compliance risk is the use of unapproved applications known as shadow IT. Shadow IT is not only, it possesses direct security threats such as confidential proprietary data loss, exposing customer information and uncontrolled data. It can also cause businesses to fall to fail compliance audits. If your company is handing client information under an NDA, for instance, using online translation tools, software that is free out there on the internet, is not encrypted or protected by a firewall, could be seen as a contract violation. Placing confidential proprietary information within the cloud can be seen as a direct violation of most NDAs and could lead to a long legal battle, including a lawsuit for damages. So how to prevent this? Once the company's compliance policy and training program is in place, it must be communicated to employees and operations overseas, which can add another challenge itself. The best way to minimize risk is to translate and localize all compliance related documentation into the employee's native languages and regulatory send out communication regarding these practices. Failing to use this local language when distributing compliance materials may end up in costly legal battles as well. An example that comes up is one of the world's largest multinational oil and natural gas service companies experienced compliance violations from its employees. With subsidiaries and operations in more than 100 countries across the globe, it is the responsible of the company to translate its compliance policies into language other than English. As the company failed to respect this rule, it had to pay over $252 million in penalties and fines. Yikes. So the solution I present to you, reducing risk by integrating translation at the core of your business process. With Systrin, you are able to handle in-house the translation of all multilingual documents, whether you're a European-based multinational that trades with the US and is facing Sarbanes-Oxley for the first time, or a banking company that complies with EU regulations. Systrin streamlines the production of your multilingual documents securely and according to existing standards and regulations. One last issue on this topic that I would like to mention is the arising challenge of audio, especially when man managing regulated users. Audio is the second element of language and is becoming more and more of a challenge since more companies, especially in these times, are using a variety of applications and need to assure things remain in compliance, especially in more remote workplaces. First part of impact is gathering of the data and bringing them together, which typically we see in WAV formats. There's no need to organize into language batches for Cistron does that for you. The system then transcribes and then translates. In case any of you guys are concerned with identification of multi multi multiple speakers, our software can handle such challenges. Although we usually think of audio in terms of landlines and cell phones, However, especially in this pandemic, we're seeing the expanded use of other platforms such as Zoom, Skype, Teams, amongst others. And all these conversations can be useful for companies when transcribed for documentation purposes, learning purposes, as well as for regu regulated user compliance. In recent news I just read, a major global bank significant, had a significant supervisory failures around inappropriate internal access of heavily regulated information reminds us once again of how important regulatory compliance has become and how steep the penalties can be for failure to adopt the appropriate processes and technologies. The Financial Industry Regulatory Authority fined a major goal of bank 12.5 million for lack of communication compliance. I will now be passing along to Philip, one of our technical account managers who will give a demonstration on another way we can assist, which is transcription. Great, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Alejandro. Let me uh, share my screen. Hello, everybody. Here's my screen coming up in a second or two. Let me know when you see it. Should be up by now. Essentially, in addition to translating text, uh, which could actually come from a web speech API, uh, so you can have actually audio captured straight into the web, into the text input, and in addition to translating files, there is a certain category of files that actually contain audio. 
And so that's the scenario we're looking at here. Speech translation involves translating files that are in MP3 format in some cases or in WAV audio file format and a few others. You might convert them between first or you might submit them as such. And essentially the mechanism is very similar. You, um, you have a file in a given language. Maybe you don't know which language it is and you could do an analysis of that first. <laughs> On our implementation with this particular transcription service, it's not doing that. So uh, if you know which language it is, that's uh, a better start. Uh, but there's many different scenarios imaginable. With API, you might be able to run a, a test also to see what language could it be before you decide to actually have it translated along with the transcription. Uh, so here I'm simply going to select French and uh, translating it to English. And that translation is going to start with a transcription. Right, so I have a file here that contains something in French and um, it's going to analyze it by sending it to a transcription service. That's, that transcription service can typically run also on premise, right? It doesn't have to be in the cloud. Uh, your translation server can be in the cloud or on premise. Uh, and in this particular case, I am on premise with a local IP address. Uh, and so you see it uh, going through transcription and then at some point, uh, it will be ready and have received that transcription and then go through translation, which is usually much faster than the transcription, uh, the time it takes to transcribe. So at this point, even though we submitted a French uh, piece of audio, uh, what we download is the translated English result. <clears throat> and so this was some, some article about uh, COVID uh, uh, evolution or policies in France. Um, <clears throat> what you also want to do quite often is actually see the original text in the transcribed form that's still in the foreign language. So the editor can let you do that. You can um, open the, the post editor and it's really called a post editor because you don't use it just to look at the sentences or the content. You also use it typically to make changes and improvements if you find something's missing. Uh, sometimes it's really just punctuation. Some of the transcription services will give proper punctuation. It, they are able more and more to detect uh, if a question mark should be added based on how the, the voice was raised. Uh, maybe an exclamation mark if it sounds like I was uh, yelling, <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, also gender identification and speaker identification. So you might see different colors. Uh, or you might see different, uh, different speaker numbers. Here's an example with uh, speaker one and speaker two. Uh, so that would be a dialogue, for instance, a phone conversation that uh, you are transcribing. And then of course you might also want to simply scrub through that. And as you scrub through that, um, see where that sentence actually is or the group of sentences that the audio uh, that con that's contained in that audio. And if you find the need to make any changes, you see here the original transcription that came from the transcription service. Uh, you can make changes to that. Uh, maybe you want to spell something out instead of showing a number, right? Uh, so you can, you can put a, a couple of changes there where necessary. Sometimes it's really just very noisy audio and you hear it differently than what the transcription had. Uh, so a little bit of uh, post editing might be really useful then have it retranslated and then having it uh, validated so that you can actually look at that and say, okay, that's a really good translation. We want to keep doing that. If we have a transcription of this sort, we want to have it improved that way. Uh, and all of this really you want to also quite often uh, keep using so you can send it back into the translation server as a, what we call a translation memory. Uh, more importantly, also export it into something like a plain text file or a tab separated values file. TMX is another option. Uh, translation memory exchange. That's a format that's very useful, especially if you're in fact you looking for the transcription uh, in addition to the translation. Right? So here you have the French and then there's a tab separating from the English translation that we added to that. And it's quite easy from there to uh, take it into actually just having the translation or the transcription. All right, that's uh, it for the quick demo on the um, <clears throat> on the speech translation, of course, there are many different scenarios in terms of uh, file sizes, uh, file uh, types. Uh, some of the transcription services will support more file formats. Others will have other languages. 
So uh, you know, we have we have a couple of partnerships and integrations here, and we're constantly looking at others that we can add as well. Plus, there is an API, so you can certainly integrate that with your own. If you already have a transcription service, you can integrate that and use our API uh, to do the translation there, thereafter. All right, let me uh, let me send it back to you, uh, Alejandro. Thank you for that, Philip. Now let's head into our second topic. Learn how you can quickly take data from diverse systems and translate it. The unique thing about our software is that the raw opportunities truly are endless. We have the ability to link with so many different systems from relativity to email servers, really anything that's text-based, as well as the ability to take data that's structured and unstructured, whether you're traditional Excel, Word, or text data and social media. Another way would be through API. SysTrans Enterprise Server Translate API is a tool that automatically translates text from one language to another language. The source text is a text to be translated. The source language is the language that the source text is written in. The target language is the language that the source text is translated into. Our sophisticated REST API supports translation, language detection, dictionary management, and use as well as corpus management. It's ideal for quick prototyping and proof of concept work, cloud services, and automated translation services. Add translation functionality pro programmatically into your existing applications. It's also currently uh, compatible with Google in case your code is already written in there, as well as you can access from our own business applications via open APIs. Now let's talk about a tool that can assist with the challenge of multilingual correspondence, particularly in a group setting. That's where the S box comes into play. It's a convenient way of translating files by dropping these into a language specific folder. Support for files in different formats, you can configure to support one or more languages which identify the source language of the document and the desired translated language. You can segment into separate project folders and work in collaboration with others securely. As well as a, it also includes a faster PDF translation. Now we'll go back to Philip to show us how great and simple this tool is to use. Oh, all right. Uh, hello again. So let me share my screen one more time here. Uh, do, 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 do. Share my screen. There you go. So um, what, what we see here is indeed um, what we call the S box and it addresses the need sometimes to translate not just by yourself, but perhaps in a collaborative environment or perhaps um, something like, like you, you have a, a flow of files coming in and you don't know exactly when there's like constant trickle down and maybe somebody else preparing them for you. And so what we want to do is tr to translate these files uh, sort of in an asynchronous way. Right? So, if you can see my screen at this time, um, we basically are looking at this uh, green area here. That's the green zone is what uh, would be running on a Windows system. That could be a server. It could be your desktop. In fact, it's ready for you know a laptop, a desktop, a Windows, a Windows 10, for example. Uh, and we run, we install the S box on that. Now, in itself, the S box doesn't do the translation, but it processes uh, files that get dropped into an inbox, right? So there's a, it sets up a drop in box for a given language direction, for instance, English to Spanish, ENES. And that can be a shared folder. So uh, it, this could be something I have on my own if this is my system, but it could also be simply a, a Windows server that's set up with a shared folder. So PC user number one, if they have access to that shared folder, they can simply drop their files right in there and they get in there. And then PC number user, PC number, uh, user number two can do the same thing. Uh, there might be others uh, outside the network, maybe with a tunnel connection or on the same uh, network, Wi-Fi, whatever it is. Uh, user number two could be on Mac OS, I, uh, could be on an I iPad, it could be on tablets, on Linux platforms, many different environments. As long as you have access to that drop folder. Right. You're not going to need to log in on a web browser. You're not going to need to install an application on your Windows desktop. Like we have so many choices for that as well. Uh, the convenient thing here is that it simply allows you to configure it, especially your IT department, 
to uh, say, let's set up a folder in which they're going to drop this file in. And we don't know when, but every once in a while, a file or maybe a whole folder and a whole uh, hierarchy structure of many files will be dropped in here. Uh, could be thousands of files through the day, could be uh, a lot of those, many different formats, including email files. Uh, this will support also MSG files or email files from, uh, from, uh, from a Mac environment, EML files. Uh, so these files um, will basically be scrutinized by the SBOX application. Every five seconds, every 10 seconds, whichever way you configure it, it could be every minute or every hour. Uh, you could say, let's go take a look to see if there's any files in there. And it checks and grabs them and sends them for translation. Right, so this is where the Sistran SPNS uh, funeral server comes in. That's actually doing the translation, but it is managed by the SBox to see if there is something to translate. And in some cases, even pre-process it. For instance, if it's an email, it may have attachments and you can configure it to not have those attachments translated or to actually have them as well. And they could be emails themselves and have a hierarchy of multiple emails attached to each other. Uh, so it will translate all of that, the subject, the body and the emails uh, attachments if you want to. Uh, in some other cases, it will do different type of processing. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, a PDF file might need to be scanned with OCR, optical character recognition, and the server can do that. So it might just send it as is, as a PDF and by default, it will run it through optical character recognition. But if you're doing compliance, if you're doing uh, analytics, uh, e-discovery, translating thousands and thousands of files, you may not necessarily care where that word is or where the sentences are or what fonts and what color they're in, right? The size, the, the page layout, the formatting. A lot of that is why we do the OCR, the optical character recognition. It's an understatement to focus on characters. It's also really focusing on everything else, optical in that page layout. So OCR is not necessarily always needed, especially when you have massive amounts of material you want to extract quickly. And so that's where we actually introduced another mode for PDF files, which is the quick file, the quick PDF uh, option. Uh, simply extracting the text. It, of course, it requires that the text can be extracted, no password protection, no encryption, uh, not a scanned image, but actually text that you publish, for instance, from a Word application or from InDesign as you publish it to PDF. Uh, in many cases, then, we can extract that much faster. Because otherwise, uh, doing an OCR could take three, four seconds per page, and you have one, you know, one document with a hundred pages, and then you have thousands of these documents. It's going to add up very quickly just for the OCR. Uh, translating it is going to be a little bit faster. So that's basically the idea: is that we have an asynchronous behavior here. Multiple people can drop their files, or maybe it's just you. And in fact, that folder could even be on the SPNS server itself. You could have a, a Linux box here that has a GUI. Uh, that, that allows you to set up a folder and drop fi files in there as well. Uh, or even at the command line level, you, could, you can copy files into the right shared folder and they get taken over by the SBox uh, and then essentially translated. And then when they are translated, they will go into a different folder. Um, the original files will get moved into the archive folder. And then there is a, a fourth one, which is failed, which hopefully stays empty. But no, if for some reason the file cannot be translated, um, it will be moved simply into the failed area. So let's take a look at that. Um, we have essentially a main processing folder set up. In that main processing folder, we have already a couple of uh, uh, folders for each direction of the translation language. Uh, we have a drop in in each of those. So for example, here is the uh, Spanish to English. Right? So if you look at what's in the Spanish to English, there is a drop in. That's exactly this one here. So this, this is a simply a, a shortcut or a link to that. Uh, but you can also have that uh, made available or presented to your desktop or other places in many other ways. And so the only thing we need at that point is drop some files in here, in here to get them translated. Right? So if we, um, if we look at, uh, for example, we have some files here um, that might be email files, might be a whole directory structure of files. Uh, here's a, uh, just two levels. In this simple case, we have two text files here, but there's another subdirectory with two more text files. Some of them might be duplicates. They'll just translate a little bit faster since the server will cache it uh, if you want to. I mean, all that is configurable. 
Uh, and so what, what you'll do at that point is simply make a copy of that and drop it into the, uh, the folder, right? If it's Spanish to English, you need some Spanish content. Uh, I think I have a Spanish file here. Let's put it right in there. This one is some banking information, uh, opening an account in Spain. Uh, and so every once in a while, this will go away if, you, if it's getting translated. Of course, we need to make sure we actually launch the program. So I haven't done that yet. Right now here is my shortcut for uh, Sistran SBox, right? And so when I launch this, it's basically ready to, to go if it's already configured. The configuration will allow you to say uh, which languages you want. Uh, you'll see, for instance, I have so many languages, but right now I only need to process files for a particular project that go English to Spanish, French to English, a couple of others. They may also be identified by different domains. If you're doing something automotive related or something uh, human resources related, translating material that's uh, gaming related, not that you necessarily translate the game. You're with some multi-billion company and, uh, you know, traded on the stock exchange and, and it's really important that nobody leaks information about the next uh, game that's going to be worth billions so so you're 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 looking for keywords and uh, it helps if you have a specialized engine to do so not one that's just generic because you know you have a specialized one where you're looking for terminology of very particular meaning uh, for instance jelly beans might not be the candy it might be drugs or something like that uh, so once you've done that, once you've set it up, you simply start the processing. And right now it's every five seconds. You can change that to a different frequency. And it looks in all of the folders. I have four folders here currently configured. So it looks in all of them and it sees if there's anything to translate. It did find one of them and it's already done. So when I look at the Spanish to English, uh, that file is still there. Oh, it just disappeared. So it basically just went, finished the translation and it is now translated here. Uh, amongst others I've done in the past. And um, I also have the archived copy in here. Right, so this is the original that was, uh, that's still in Spanish. Uh, and I can do the same thing with other files. I have uh, maybe some English files now. I have some, some uh, files in English that I want to translate to Japanese. Uh, again, this is something that you might see uh, when you're doing, especially in a multi, in a global, multilingual, multinational environment, you may have uh, offices in different countries and uh, speaking different languages and you have communication material, you have human resources material, you have uh, alerts, notifications, training material, a lot of different things that need to be uh, translated and as they get through the pipeline of the different developers and the graphic artists and the content writers and so on uh, when something needs to be translated uh, you're ready to send it in right so it could be an email uh, it could be the attachment to an email or it could be an email with attachments uh, so you can send those in uh, let's do that from english to spanish simply copy those right in there right if you prefer drag and drop, you can do that. The file won't disappear, even if it's on the same uh, partition or on the same disk. Uh, it's simply gonna la land in the, um, in the archived area. But you see here now gradually these files disappearing as they're ge getting processed. And uh, so that's basically the, the very summary on uh, translating with SBox. So uh, you could run a second session. They are basically, uh, you know, it could be processing in parallel if you want one configured for a particular mm -hmm. project and another one for a different project. Uh, each user can have their own copy or you could have uh, a few that are, uh, you know, different users that are all sharing that same shared folder. Uh, and of course, it's not the only way to do this. Uh, and there is a little delay before it looks again, right? Every second, every five seconds, depending on how you set that up. But you could go one file at a time as fast as, let's not wait, zero seconds. And the moment one file is done, it immediately starts taking the next one. But here's the thing, that's just one file at a time. Now it's looking at all of the folders and you may have 20 different languages that all need translating. And so you can uh, have 20 of these files submitted and managed by SBox at the same time. There are other tools we have, uh, such as the quick file translator, where you simply right click a folder mm -hmm. and uh, select sister and translate. And then all of the files that are in that folder are subject to translation. Right? So you could say, for instance, you only want to see the text file uh, in there and uh, search for any of the text files that are there and then start translating them. Now, those, that's going to take uh, a little bit longer if you have thousands or millions of files. And the overhead is mostly on the disk I.O. You know, saving that information takes some time. But it is uh, very efficient as well. It's just a different uh, workflow because 
that you have to install that application pack, whereas here you have to install nothing. The only place where something needs to be installed with the SBox is where the SBox is going to run, and that does not have to be your system. It could be a server or a dedicated high-end uh, mobile workstation that's even you know, mobile, and at the end of the day, you lock it down in the vault, uh, beyond secure. And so there is a lot of different ways to use that uh, with a number of parameters that might be particularly useful, again, with the PDF to say whether you want to extract from PDF versus uh, actually run them through OCR on the server. Uh, I mentioned the delay, the time, what type of files, patterns you want to look for. If, for instance, today you only need docx or XLS. Uh, or, or file patterns in the file name. Uh, and also emails, uh, you can have them, but you don't necessarily always want the attachments translated, especially if they are PDFs and uh, might uh, delay a lot. So a lot of different things that you can do here, including be prepared for something that occasionally doesn't work because the server may be down and you say, okay, well, let's try it three, four times uh, so that if a file fails, it's not gonna give up. It's gonna try again uh, a little bit later. Uh, and there's a number of other things. Sometimes you find very large files and you need a timeout of more than six hours. Right? So there's there's some, some criteria here that you only know because you know how big those files are or how massive the, the material is, terabytes of data you want to process in this way. Again, I think the, the most significant thing with the uh, SBox is that it is an asynchronous world and a very easy one for a collaborative environment. Right, it's a really easy one to set up if you have multiple users, they're all working on the same content or same project, but different files. Some of them are linguists and they, they process the Koreans, they make sure it is Korean, and then they drop it in. Another one looks at the Russian material and then they drop that in. Uh, and eventually, you know, maybe the project manager will see the results coming in and they, they submit it to your uh, e-discovery or analytics software for the forensics research or whatever, the, the, whatever you want to call it as you analyze and look for the, uh, for the needle in the haystack, so to speak, that we hope we never find, right, when it comes to compliance. So that's it for the uh, S-Box. Uh, I'll send it back to you. Thanks again, Philip. Let me uh, make sure I can stop sharing. There you go. Perfect. Let me get back to mine. <clears throat> One last topic I wanted to cover with everybody is the importance of e-learning and the impact on the regulated user. Let's first begin with defining who the regulated users are, which are include traders and their support staff or researchers, analysts, middle and back-end office personnel, really anyone involved in the firm's trading strategies. In order to be compliant, regulated users and their supervisors need to be trained thoroughly. And often there are a lot of training materials needed to be translated, videos transcribed, subtitles, even speech attacks in order to make sure employees understand thoroughly in order to comply. The second component after training is the management of regulated users within financial organizations. Management needs to be able to handle high volumes of call traffic, which can equal to millions of conversations per year from tens of thousands of regulated users in a centralized fashion. This is where machine translation becomes extremely valuable in being able to set up a system with the capacity to handle such volume with red alerts needed. This becomes imperative because the DOJ wants organizations to be clear on how they are being compliant. And trust me, you do not want to be caught being non-compliant. $381 billion worth of cumulative financial penalties were imposed on European and North American banks globally from the financial crisis till the end of 2019 as regulators have stepped up scrutiny. With that note, that's all we have for you guys today. Uh, I thank you guys all for joining. I'll display my contact information and Philip and I will now take any, now answer any questions that were asked and CJ will say them out loud. So we've got a few questions here that we've collected so far, but of course, if there are any new questions based on you know, these answers, feel free to send them over as well. So first question we have is, is there a way to get a reverse translation to check that the translation was correct? I guess I can answer that question. Yes, um, there is definitely ways to do that very quickly. 
Um, if, for instance, you have a, a piece of text that you translate, you copy paste that from, uh, let's say, an open email, you want to do some, uh, some spot checking, uh, or you have a training guide and you want to see how the terminology is being picked up, um, you can definitely you know, paste that into the, the input text pane, uh, translate it, grab that, switch with one button click uh, the direction to go from uh, let's say initially it was English to Japanese now you take it from Japanese back to English and translate it back. Um, what, wh one thing that you can also do is having those translations from the first pass uh, or the, the source actually from the initial um, to have that uh, put into what we call translation memories right so basically you have a whole table of sentences that you are about to translate. And then you also do a reverse collection and you see if the translations during the reverse translation uh, matches or comes very close to each sentence by sentence as, as it's being shown in something we call a fuzzy match. Well, it's, uh, if it's an identical match, then we know we're spot on, it's an exact match and we actually use that as the output so you won't see a difference at all. But you might still be interested in seeing if there are some slight differences, right? Because you might see something translating in an even more fluid way. Right, is something like this ain't right or this is not right versus this isn't right. Uh, but also could be this is wrong. <laughs> and so that's where the language of course is very flexible and sometimes uh, you, you see there's actually a couple of different ways to translate it. And even though it's not the same thing, the same words, uh, and especially with regard to automated scoring, like blue scores and so on, it might look like it's only 80 or 70%. Uh, it's still better and sometimes, you know, it's still great. Uh, it's definitely human quality in most cases. In many cases, we see sometimes even superhuman, we call it, uh, meaning that it's not only on spot on in terms of the linguistics, but also on uh, the subject matter uh, expertise. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's recognizing the terminology, right? If you have POS, not stand for point of sale or part of speech or my initials, <laughs> but uh, something like a medical term like pulmonary ovary syndrome or something like that. Uh, same with other acronyms quite often they have different ways to translate like new PS. Uh, could that be something like uh, the, the shipping company, uh, United Parcel Service, or is it more something like uh, uninterrupted power supply? In, in German, it will become a different translation. And so when you translate it back, you know, you want to know, does it get it back to uh, the same UPS that it started from? Uh, so that's very important, and we do that in a few ways. The API also has some capabilities uh, that allow you to return not just the translation, but the original, so you can start fiddling with the data and see another translation come back to the same. So there's plenty of ways to, to work with that, with translation memories, with API, with copy-paste, uh, spot checking, absolutely. Great, thanks, Philip. Uh, next question is what OCR and speech engine do you use? Good question. So OCR, uh, optical character recognition that we use is uh, by default the one from a company owned by Canon. They know scanners, they do pretty good with that. Uh, it's called Iris, the Iris uh, OCR engine. Uh, it's a Canon company and uh, of course it keeps evolving just like the translation technology itself. It has gone uh, into neural uh, deep learning, especially for Arabic and Farsi and other languages that don't know spaces between the letters, they're connected like cursive. Uh, and, and, but for others to uh, recognizing more and more whether something is a picture in the background or a pattern that should be ignored or simply noise. Uh, some of the challenges there, of course, stamps, fingerprints, smudges, having something scanned quickly that's at a slight rotational angle. Uh, and then something like a stamp on top of it that says confidential. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to scan and separate all these and put them back into uh, the right layers if you want. Uh, but yeah, we do that. And th we have an option also with Abbey. Uh, you, can, you can purchase a, a module, an extra optional module with the Abbey uh, a fine reader. Uh, that one is pretty nice, uh, nicely recommended for large tables. If you have super large complex tables, rotated uh, tables with vertical or horizontal content, they sometimes do, they, they usually do better with that, but it's really a matter of focus. And also when do you check? A few months later, things tilt back and forth all the time. Uh, they are similar. At some point, you might perhaps conclude that one is the one for you. Uh, and then in some cases, some of the workflows recommended actually would be to use it separately, to do the OCR separately. 
right? Because we have some customers that see that there is a need to pre-process after the OCR, the image is there, it's in a, in a Word document, no longer in a PDF, uh, and they still see, oh, there's some signatures and other things we want to get rid of. Uh, maybe the header and the footer, we don't want to get that repeated material there. It's not of any good use for the particular translation idea, why they're translating it, maybe just the body of the text. So, so sometimes you have that workflow and it's better to actually separate the OCR from it. But when you need to do everything in one uh, single operation, uh, we do have that OCR uh, from, uh, from IRIS. There's also an additional module for PDF handling that doesn't do OCR, it's extracting the text. It's reading the, the tags, uh, the content inside the file if it can, it analyzes it to see if it's actually a scanned image or something that's editable and can extract the text from. Uh, so that one we call the precise PDF option. We also do just the plain text extraction without OCR. Uh, on the speech recognition side, uh, the engines there, um, we have had uh, relationships with uh, a couple of them. There is Vocapia in France. They support a couple of file formats, WAVE, MP, MP3. We integrated with that. They also support a number of things like aligning the text with the audio. Uh, which is what we expose and show in our speech uh, post editor. Uh, there is another one that you may recognize perhaps more in the US uh, from Nuance. Um, so Nuance is one that we also have partnered with and they do uh, have a few other languages. Um, they, they use Japanese for instance, if you need to transcribe Japanese, uh, I would recommend them. There are others out there though, and we're always looking at, uh, you know, either recommending or, or looking at, especially if you're integrating something yourself through their API, uh, that's definitely doable. Uh, there's a few good ones, uh, solid German engineering, so I'm not gonna mention them, but you'll, see, you'll hear them in the news probably, uh, with or without us, right? I mean, some of them are, are new kids on the block and uh, they do just two or three languages, but they have new technology that's particularly suitable. And the moment you need that language, it's probably the one to go for, right? Uh, so there's, there's a, a number of choices and we would recommend, uh, you know, talk to us. We can have a, a dialogue with a couple of, uh, uh, names on there, but sometimes under NDA, uh, but it's definitely a good discussion to have. Okay, and I think we have uh, time for just one more question. Uh, so this is, we use a Tivio for alert management. Can you guys integrate to that? Uh, could you repeat that? I was a little bit uh, low volume. I couldn't hear it. A Tivio for alert management. Can you okay. guys integrate to that? Yeah, Activio. I'm not very familiar with it, but I've heard of it, and it's definitely a name that, because I've heard of it, probably yes. Uh, um, you know, we we have actually actually I've heard that we have some customers using it. I'm not sure exactly how, but most of the time these programs, whether it's a learning management system or some sort of a database or some sort of uh, uh, you know analytics program, uh, many times they have interfaces that are directly a REST-based interface or some scripting level, uh, sort of a hook by which you can get something into it, a JavaScript, uh, some portal uh, of uh, some scripting inter interpretation, uh, sometimes Lua, uh, Lua scripting super fast, especially in the gaming environment. Uh, so there is um, and, and oil and gas, that's where it was <laughs> developed for. But so uh, whether you do Python, whether you do many of these languages, JavaScript has become su super fast also in recent years. Um, so there is a, a number of ways by which you can integrate in that. And uh, definitely we have some customers using it with this as well. And, and you know, sometimes uh, the question goes more into, well, what about the formats of the files that we see over there, right? Sometimes you have the environment that can translate that uh, the interface of it uh, or, or it's simply an HTML page in your web browser and we have tools for that as well uh, such as the JavaScript widget uh, but sometimes it's more than just that interface sometimes it's about well the files that you're using in your day-to-day -day operations through that interface right it's a content management system learning management system whatever it is and you have files going back and forth something like a SharePoint equivalent and so on and you want to to not just translate the interface uh, and maybe some, some basic uh, text messages, maybe you have a chat or something like that, but you also want to translate the content that is in the files. So there are some file formats that we see used in compliance, uh, especially with the Department of Justice and a few others that, that are standardizing more and more on formats that they actually create the content in. Uh, so PDF has been used, but that's not 
that's not, I mean, you, you could use Acrobat and many do, but uh, many other tools are used to create the content. InDesign is another format. And sometimes we're looking at these and these are formats we may not necessarily have on the server in a native form way. But there's many ways to put that into SBox, and you know we encourage you to uh, to talk to us to uh, to see what we can do. If it's a for if it's a file that you haven't seen mentioned in our server, we may have it already somewhere else. Alrighty, so we did get a couple more questions, but we are um, out of time, so we're going to go ahead and address those in a follow up webinar, uh, a follow up email. I mean, sorry, uh, with additional information after the webinar. So this would conclude our presentation for today. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add, Philip or Alejandro? Uh, I'd just like to say thank you everybody for joining us today and um, I really appreciate it. And hopefully this information was helpful. Uh, my contact information is right there on the screen. So please reach out and hopefully we can set up a meeting and chat a little more and I'll hand it off to you, Phil. I think you can talk about maybe a webinar you have coming up soon here. Yes, indeed. In about uh, two weeks or so, we have a webinar, end of uh, September, a webinar that's focused on speech and uh, both the speech translation we saw today, but one or two others, and also the API. So we'll be doing a, a deep dive on the speech translation and audio processing. Perfect. So thank you again, everyone. And that's about it. Take care and have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.